Good morning, friends. Welcome to the worship service of Beacon Christian Church, a faith community dedicated to being witnesses and disciples who do justice and show kindness in the name of Jesus Christ. Thanks so much for being a part of this community today. You know, you're not just a spectator watching the service. You are a participant in the service and you are part of this community. And we are so glad to have you. No matter when or where you're watching this service, you're a part of the Beacon community of faith. And we're glad to count you as a member of this community. If you would be so kind as to take a moment to fill out our digital connection card at beaconlex.org slash connection. That just gives us a chance to connect with you. It gives you an opportunity to tell us ways that we can be preparing for you, ways that we can be serving you. So please do take a moment to fill that out. Also take a moment to pull up today's bulletin at beaconlex.org slash bulletin. Uh, and there's a link to that in the video description as well. The bulletin has today's order of service and some important announcements. So you're going to want to make sure that you pull that up. We will be concluding our For the Life of the World Bible study this evening from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, and we'll have our regular prayer meeting as scheduled on Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. as well. The Google Meet links for both of those are, are on our website. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to be beginning a new Bible study in the lead up to Easter, and it's a study called The Case for Easter. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about that, you can click the link in the bulletin that will show you uh, an informational video about what that study is all about. And that'll be a four week study leading us up till Easter Sunday. I'm really excited about it. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. So I encourage you to come join us for that as well. And just a reminder that throughout the season of Lent, we're going to be having daily prayer videos Monday through Saturday. There are videos that adapt the daily office from the Book of Common Prayer, incorporating guided prayer reading of the Psalms, uh, an Old Testament, and New Testament reading, uh, as well as uh, time for open prayer. Uh, these aren't live streamed, they're just videos for you to participate in at your convenience. And so I would highly encourage you to take advantage of those leading up to Easter as well. And now, friends, as we turn our hearts and minds toward the Lord, I encourage you to take a moment to take a deep breath and set aside everything that may be weighing you down, any worries or anxieties that may be on your heart and mind, so that you can turn your mind toward the Lord and give him the worship that he so richly deserves. And hear now the words of our call to worship from the psalmist. Psalm 22, 23 through 31. Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob. Show him reverence, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but he has listened to their cries for help. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. Their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. The whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. For royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all the nations. What the rich of the earth... What the rich of the earth feast and worship, bow before him all who are mortal, all whose lives will end as dust. Our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not born yet. They will hear about everything he has done. And now, friends, let us come before the Lord with one heart and mind for today's prayers of the people. Heavenly Father, on this Sunday in Lent, we think of those who are acutely tempted, tempted to look the other way when wrong is happening, tempted to misuse their gifts for a sordid purpose, tempted to allow untamed emotions to hold sway, tempted by the corrupting power of money, and those tempted to stay in a rut rather than strike out on new paths for Jesus. Generous God, steer us through times of temptation and deliver us from evil. Lord, listen to our prayers for others at this time, for those who hunger for bread but find only stones, for those who seek justice but can find no advocate who will help them, for those who are in danger and have no one watching over them. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord God, there are many among us who face barren times, wilderness times in our lives. Help us to minister your loving presence to those in the wilderness so that they may come through and enter the promised land. 
Help us to bring food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, shelter to the homeless, courage to those who faint, and hope to those who are tempted to despair. We pray also for the many who feel pushed and tested almost beyond their endurance. Those in positions of heavy responsibility who feel overloaded to the point of collapse or those pressured from all sides by factions in their workplace or community. Suffering people and all who must watch a loved one suffer, who feel they can bear no more. Folks whose patience with a difficult friend is now at a breaking point. Persecuted Christians whose faith seems stretched beyond their limit. And the depressed whose inner being endures a misery which no human word can alleviate. Merciful God, steer us through the wilderness and deliver us from evil. We also pray for those who seem to be in a position of advantage. The happy, that their happiness may always be used for goodwill and compassion. The strong, that their energies may be used wisely and gently. The clever, that they may employ their mental faculties for good and not evil. For the rich, that their wealth may be shared for the uplifting of the poor. For the powerful, that they may use their position as a blessing to humanity. And those of strong faith, that they may walk humbly and affirm the weaker souls. Righteous God, steer us through the wilderness and deliver us from evil. And we pray for one another in this church. None of us knows the extent of the pressures that some may be under this very day. Look upon us all, read our thoughts, and weigh our feelings, and by your resourcefulness, save us in the time of trial. Lead us through the wilderness and deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught his followers to pray this prayer that we now pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today for worship. Our first song in worship today is Here I Am to Worship. It may be um, our, our prayer today as we refocus ourselves from everything we did this week and everything we have to do next week. Let this be a moment where we can really reflect on being in the presence of God, each in our own individual homes. So Here I Am to Worship, followed by Mighty to Save. So may this be our hope and prayer today that we are ready and we are here to worship. If you will, please join me in singing. Light of a world you stepped down into darkness Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you So here I am to worship Here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted. Glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created. All for 
love's sake became more. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely. All together worthy, all together wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know. How much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely. All together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Our second song is Mighty to Save. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on us. May mercy fall on us that we may in turn be merciful to those around us. So if you will, please join me as we sing Mighty to Save. He is our Savior. He can move mountains in our lives. He is mighty to save. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in, now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Amen. And now, friends, let us enter into our time of corporate confession. This prayer of confession will be call and response. Uh, I, as the leader, will say the first part, and then you will say the second part as the words appear on your screen. 
So please join me in this prayer of confession. Lord, when facing temptation, Jesus refused to turn stones into bread. Facing temptation, we too often turn bread into stones. Facing temptation, Jesus refused to use power for its own sake. Facing temptation, we too often take power that belongs to someone else. Facing temptation, Jesus refused to test the promises of God. Facing temptation, we too often want God to do what we should do ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, for giving in to this temptation. Restore us to right relationship with you, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, Scripture tells us that if we confess our sins, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So take heart and rejoice, friends. Through Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Amen. At this time in our service, it's time for our children's message. So go ahead and have the kids gather around whatever device you're watching so they can see and hear. And adults, as always, you make sure that you pay attention too, because I promise you there's something you can get out of this as well. Well, kids, today I want to talk to you about being spectacular. The word spectacular means something really amazing and great and big and famous. With that in mind, let me ask you this. You know, the Super Bowl was just a few weeks ago. Do you think that if you and I, if we all put together a football team, that we could win the Super Bowl? That would be pretty spectacular if we could, but I'm pretty sure we couldn't do it. Although we couldn't do something spectacular like that, I bet that if we went outside and played football together right now, we'd have a lot of fun spending time together, right? My kids and I love playing football together. When we do that, it may not look spectacular, but I bet that God would be glad that we were running around and enjoying the bodies that he gave us. What if we emptied our pockets and our wallets and put all of our money together? Do you think that we could feed all the hungry people in the world with that money? That would be spectacular if we could, but I'm pretty sure that we would come up short. Although we can't do something spectacular like that, I bet if we put our money together, we could feed at least one person one meal that they need. It may not look spectacular, but I bet that God would be glad that we were giving up something of ours to help someone else. In the Bible reading that Pastor Phil is going to do for us in just a moment, Jesus was out in the desert all by himself, and the devil was tempting him to be spectacular, to be so great and powerful that everyone would notice how awesome he was. The devil told Jesus that if he wanted to, he could turn rocks into bread, but Jesus didn't want to do that. The devil told Jesus that if Jesus would climb all the way to the tallest building in the city and jump off, God's angels would swoop in and catch Jesus before he hit the ground. But Jesus didn't want to do that either. Then the devil tried one last time to get Jesus to want to be spectacular. The devil told Jesus that he could be the ruler of every country and every army in the world, and that Jesus could be the richest man in the world. Then everybody would notice how great and powerful Jesus was. But Jesus didn't want to do that either. Jesus said, I came here to worship and serve God, not to be great and powerful and spectacular in any of those ways. And that's what we're supposed to do in our life of following Jesus. We may end up being spectacular in people's eyes. We may become famous or rich or popular, and that's fine if it happens, but it probably won't. And what Jesus teaches us is that God doesn't seem to care all that much about whether or not we do spectacular things all the time, but if we do the right things all the time. God doesn't seem to want us to love being spectacular, but to love God and to love other people instead. A very smart woman named Mother Teresa once said, We can do no great things on earth, only small things with great love. Thank you, God, that you don't care much about the spectacular things, but instead care about the important things, like loving you and loving our neighbors. Help us to care more about doing the right thing than doing the spectacular thing. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Beloved, hear the word of God. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, then tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No. The scripture says people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city Jerusalem, to the highest point in the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scripture says he will order his angels to protect him, and he will, they will hold him up with their hands, so he won't even hurt a foot on a stone. Jesus responded, The scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak on a, of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will, give it to you. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scripture says you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In his book entitled A Million Miles in a Thousand Years, Donald Miller tells the story of his quest to go from a sedentary, overweight guy to being someone who hikes the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. Hiking the Inca Trail is a four-day endeavor which covers 25 miles and nearly 5,000 feet of vertical gain right at the beginning. On the day they were to begin their hike, the guide took the group to the starting point and pointed to the river thousands of feet in the valley below them. He told them that they could follow the trail along the river and be in Machu Picchu in six hours. In ancient times, the trail along the river was the commercial route, but anyone who was visiting Machu Picchu on a pilgrimage had to take the Inca Trail. When one of the hikers asked the guide why the Incas forced people to take the longer and more difficult and ultimately excruciatingly hard route, the guide answered, because the emperor knew the more painful the journey, the more the traveler would appreciate Machu Picchu once he got there. Miller relates his doubts about whether he could actually complete the hike and discusses learning about his own identity and character throughout the painfully difficult four days of hiking through the wilderness. The wilderness gives you time to think. It gives you time for introspection. The wilderness is a place where doubts and temptations and questions abound. The wilderness might just reveal who we really are. In today's scripture, Jesus is driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And wilderness is a common theme this time of year. It characterizes the spiritual journey of Lent. Throughout the scriptures, wilderness is a place of testing. It was in the wilderness that Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai to receive the law. It was in the wilderness that Israel rebelled and grumbled against God, which caused an embittered Moses to strike the rock at Meribah, an act which ultimately would keep him from entering the promised land. It was in the wilderness that God fed the people manna from heaven. The wilderness was where Israel learned what it meant to be the people of God through failure and second chances and more failure and more chances. It was into the wilderness that Elijah fled when he feared for his life because of Queen Jezebel. And in the wilderness, Elijah laid down under a tree and told God to just go ahead and kill him because he was sick of it. But God provided for Elijah and reassured him in the wilderness and reminded him of his mission. The wilderness exposes who we are in light of who God has called us to be. The wilderness is where Jesus is sent. And he doesn't make this decision by himself, but rather he does so at the urging of the Spirit, which leads him into the wilderness. We may wonder why this is necessary. 
Just before this, we have that glorious baptism scene that we talked about last week. Jesus was baptized, the heavens were open, and the voice of God proclaimed the Messiah's identity. We yearn to see what Jesus will do next, where he'll go, what his ministry will entail. It seems like it should be time for the ministry to start and to see all the awesome stuff that Jesus is going to do, right? But despite our eagerness, the next step is a private one. Jesus must go to a solitary place, far from the support of community, companionship, and even basic human comforts. Will the Messiah be what God has called him to be? The wilderness would make that known. It's an uncomfortable 40 days and 40 nights without food. And alone and with an empty stomach, Jesus now must endure three trials from the evil one. If you were the son of God, the tempter suggested, turn these stones into bread. Use your divine authority to overcome your human need. You don't need to endure this most basic of human needs that need to fill your stomach, if you so choose. The first temptation was for Jesus to remove himself from identifying with the ordinary needs of average people. Could the devil convince Jesus to distance himself from the purpose of the incarnation? No, Jesus resisted with the answer, one does not live by bread alone. See, the entirety of Jesus' ministry right up to his death on the cross was going to be an experience of personal sacrifice and the eschewing of personal comfort. If Jesus was concerned with his own material comfort, his God-given mission would have been seriously jeopardized. It's worth noting here that the temptations with which the tempter seeks to trap us are not always actions that are inherently sinful. There would have been nothing wrong with Jesus taking the action of turning bread into stones per se. But what this temptation was intended to do was to subtly shift Jesus' focus from following the will of God to focus on his own needs. And this is a tactic which the tempter continues to use today. There's nothing inherently sinful about seeking to provide for our own needs or even our own desires. But when seeking to fulfill, fulfill our needs and desires comes at the expense of following God's greatest commandments of loving God and loving other people, that is when we have allowed temptation to derail our allegiance to God. After Jesus resisted the first temptation, the tempter was already prepared with a second approach. And he took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. And scholars tell us that this pinnacle was somewhere around 180 feet high. If you're the son of God, Satan dared, throw yourself down. Now, I'll confess as someone who doesn't care much for heights, this temptation never made a whole lot of sense to me. Why would you want to throw yourself off of a 180 foot uh, space? But the temptation isn't about self-harm or thrill-seeking. The devil quoted the psalm that promises God's protection to his anointed one. He said, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The temptation is to test God. We can hear the temptation taking shape, right? God promised to protect you. You can do as you wish. Be reckless. Be unpredictable. Force God to act on his promises. See, what the tempter is trying to get Jesus to do here is to create an artificial crisis just to see if God will get him out of it. This isn't the same thing as trusting God's protection and provision in the difficult situations which one encounters in daily life. The tempter wants Jesus to prove his relationship with God, to prove that God will do what he says. And maybe the tempter is trying to convince Jesus that Jesus also needs and wants such proof of God's provision and protection. But Jesus answered, do not put the Lord your God to the test. He is secure in his relationship with God, and he doesn't try to force God to prove himself. Later in his ministry, Jesus will decry those who ask him to perform signs and miracles as proof that he was who he said he was. 
And he calls those people an evil generation because they're seeking to put God to the test, much like Satan was trying to get Jesus to do in the wilderness. Now, maybe we don't throw ourselves off the top of the temple, but have you ever approached God with the attitude of, if you were really God and you really love me, then you will do X, Y, or Z that I want you to do in this situation. Again, this is different than asking God for his provision and protection. It's telling God how to act and when to act. It's putting God to the test. Well, the tempter, after going 0 for 2, was not yet ready to admit defeat, and he made one final attempt. Atop a high mountain, we've got heights again, I don't know why, but atop a high mountain, he showed Jesus the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And Satan said, all of this I will give to you if you will just bow down and worship me. Imagine seeing laid out before you all the wealth of the most powerful nations, the strength of the world's great armies, and the wisdom of the most learned individuals. This is an offer of power and control and even peace, all of it available now with little effort. But God had sent Jesus on a mission of suffering and humility to inaugurate a kingdom that would grow like a mustard seed, slowly and unpredictably. And Jesus knew that the end of his life on earth would be a torturous death via state-sponsored execution on the cross. The devil offers power immediately if Jesus would just bow down and worship him. Satan offers Jesus the desired ends dominion over the earth without having to go through the effort of public ministry and the agony of the crucifixion. Would the Son of God take the easy way out in exchange for his relationship with the Father? No way. Jesus declared, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus remained steadfast, and with that, the devil departed. We see here that Jesus issued a command, and Satan immediately fled. Even in his weary and famished condition, Jesus still had authority over the tempter. In this final temptation, the tempter tells Jesus that if he will just fall down and worship and pledge allegiance to Satan, then Jesus will get all of the earthly power and authority. This is a temptation into which, sadly, many who consider themselves followers of Christ are falling these days. In order to gain earthly power and authority, many have become willing to turn their back on worshiping God and have instead bowed down and pledged allegiance to nationalism or a given political party or a given individual. Even with the rationale that power and authority are sought so that they can be used to impose God's will on the nation, this does not excuse the fact that the means of gaining this power and authority is to bow down and worship people and things other than God. Just as the ends would not have, been, would not have justified the means for Jesus to gain authority by worshiping Satan, so the ends do not justify the means for us. What these three temptations, when taken as a whole, indicate to us is that the temptation to depart from following God involves a twisting of reality. Was Jesus going to die if he didn't turn those rocks into bread? Obviously not, because Jesus made it out of the wilderness, right? But that's what the tempter made it sound like. Did Jesus need to force God to give a sign that he was watching over Jesus? No, but the tempter implied that Jesus would be foolish if he didn't seek such a sign. Would Jesus really accomplish his mission of gaining authority over the earth if he bowed down and worshiped Satan? No, because one, all of that authority didn't even belong to Satan. It wasn't his to offer in the first place. And two, the act of turning his back on God would have completely eliminated the true nature of Jesus's mission. All of those temptations might have sounded like good ideas, but they were all based on subtle half-truths and misrepresentations as to the true nature of God. The wilderness exposed who Jesus really is. 
He wasn't there for selfish gain, to manipulate God or to take the easy way out. Being the son of God is about far more than just having the title. Jesus chooses to remain faithful to the mission that he had been given by God. Faithfulness and fidelity to God are Jesus's identity. Through the wilderness, we see the validation of the words spoken at his baptism. Jesus is the one in whom God is well pleased. Jesus' story reminds us that we're in the wilderness too. In this Lenten journey, it may refine, reinforce, or even expose who we are. Like the wilderness of the mountains or the barren places, Lent is a time of simplicity. We're invited to remove distractions. We're invited to renew our spiritual disciplines. We're invited to refocus on our identity as Christians. Yet in the midst of this wilderness season, we may find ourselves struggling with doubts and temptations and trials. You never know what we'll encounter out there. Some of our temptations may focus on relationships. Will we remain faithful to our vows and our covenants and our duty to love our neighbors? Or will we try to exempt ourselves from the shared bonds of community and relationship? Our temptations may center on selfishness. Will we remember that our resources belong to God and should be shared with others? Or we, will we give in to the lie that we're the center of our lives? Still other temptations may deal with accomplishment. What are we willing to trade to get the job, the payout, the accolade, or the recognition? Are we willing to compromise our values and take the easy way out? There are so many trials and temptations, and at the end of the day, they all come down to one question. Who am I in Christ? What temptations are you struggling with today? What trials are you enduring? What keeps going through your mind? What keeps you from sleeping at night? What are you wrestling with? Temptation and trial are very real for any follower of Jesus. In the wilderness, as we seek to be faithful, it's almost as if we can hear the evil one tempting us. If you're really a Christian, and we know fidelity to our Christian identity is at stake. But as difficult as these trials might be, there's good news. We don't have to make this wilderness journey alone. Jesus is our guide. He models the simple yet powerful path to stand against the trials of the wilderness. How did he do it? He knew scripture. In each of his responses to temptation, Jesus quoted the words of God. With each scripture, you can almost hear the larger story coming to life. In scripture, we're reminded that we don't live on bread alone. God provides sustenance for hungry Israel. In scripture, we're reminded that God protects the anointed and the anointed is faithful and steadfast. In the Bible, worship of God and God alone is the first and greatest commandment. It's what it means to be God's people. Jesus isn't standing alone in his encounter with the devil. He's standing with the promises of a powerful God who through generations has stood steadfast with his people. Beyond the twisting of reality, for followers of Christ, temptation and trial also often involves the twisting of Scripture. Let's be honest, if I wanted to, I could use Scripture to defend slavery, war, sexism, racism, environmental degradation, and a whole host of other things which are contrary to the will and character of God. And people do twist scripture all the time in order, to, in order to further their own personal ideology. I just saw an announcement for a book which discusses how social justice is hijacking the gospel. 
as if God's concern for the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized is not a central part of God's character and a central part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Scripture can be twisted however people want to. Satan himself quoted scripture to Jesus in the process of tempting him. People can quote scripture to defend just about everything. That's why it's important for us not to just know snippets of scripture here and there, but to know the God revealed through Jesus Christ and through scripture. The Gospel of John tells us that Jesus is the word of God. And we know that scripture reveals to us the words of God. We need to know both the word and the words in order to endure the wilderness. Jesus endures through God's words. The word of God knows the words of God. In this Lenten season, we're taking a journey to simplify, to listen, to renew. And on any journey we take, we have to be prepared. And so this Lenten season, I invite you to consider memorizing and learning scripture, especially from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which reveal Jesus, the word of God, to us. And Jesus, in turn, reveals the true character of God. Often, we may be inclined to think of scripture memorization as something that's too simple or something that's only for children. But it wasn't too simple for Jesus. After all, Lent returns us to the basics of discipleship, and knowing scripture should be part of our identity. We shouldn't be content with having a vague familiarity with the Bible or having read it once or twice. God's people should know God's words. We should know the stories, memorize key verses, and allow scripture to shape our understanding of the world. At all times, immerse yourself in the world of Scripture. And you may just discover that the world of Scripture is just what you need when you're immersed in the wilderness. How do we prepare for the wilderness? We learn the words of God and we follow the word of God. Friends, may your wilderness moments prove that you know what to do. Steep yourselves in God's word. Let it seep into your heart and fill your imaginations so that through the tr toughest of trials and temptations, you will know what to do. Stand strong and firm in your identity in Christ, not wavering in faith or taking the easy way out. And as you walk in this wilderness way, may you not only be equipped with the words of God, but know that you are traveling toward the word of God who is the Son of God. May his faithfulness inspire and guard you along the way, so that in the wilderness you may prove to be a faithful child of God. Let's pray. Holy God, by the grace of Jesus Christ, you know the tests and trials we face. Walk with us through this wilderness. Help us to immerse ourselves in your words from Scripture and to model ourselves after the word of God, Jesus Christ. And just as you sent angels to minister to Jesus after his time in the wilderness, we ask that you would come to us with ministers of healing and visit us with messengers of hope so that we may return to you in faith, believing the good news of the gospel. We pray these things through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit as one God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, at this time we will enter into our time of communion meditation. And this is to prepare our hearts and minds for communion. Communion is a remembrance of the fact that God the Father sent his son Jesus Christ to earth to live a perfect life, to teach us how to live, and to ultimately lay down his life as a sacrifice for us. Communion is an act of obedience. Communion is something which opens us up to God the Father so that he can form us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. 
We practice open communion here at Beacon Christian Church. That means you don't have to be a member of Beacon in order to participate in communion with us. This may be the first time that you've ever worshipped with us, but if you desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and a closer walk with Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to participate in communion with us this morning. If we were meeting in a physical building, we would distribute the elements to you. We use bread or crackers to represent the body of Christ and juice to represent the blood of Christ. But since we're all meeting different places, participating at different times, we're each responsible for our own elements. If you don't have the exact right elements laying around, that's okay. There's nothing magical about the elements themselves. Like I said, the power of this sacrament comes in the surrendering of ourselves, the opening up of ourselves to the work that God wants to do in us. And so, friends, as we enter into this communion meditation, there will be some call and response. And I ask that when the words appear on your screen, you would go ahead and respond out loud. And I ask that you respond out loud, even if it feels a little bit weird if you're watching this by yourself. But just remember that through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, even though we're watching at different places and different times, we are truly meeting as one faith community all together. And now, friends, let us enter into our communion meditation. May the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Lord, from our beginning, you shaped us to live in service to one another and to all the earth. You set us in a garden to co-create life with you. You surrounded us with creatures and creations that depend on our care. Our destinies have always been wrapped up with one another, our individual being bound to the well-being of all. And therefore, we join our voices with your people on earth and all the company of the heavens singing praise to you. Holy, holy, holy one, God of justice and love, heaven and earth are full of your wonder. Hosanna among us. Gracious one, we struggle with spirits of fear and greed that tempt us away from your original plan for us. We excuse ourselves from our responsibilities to our neighbors. We struggle to believe that we have anything to offer to the whole. And at times we knowingly do harm to others for the sake of our own gain. You know our struggles, O oh God. And so you sent us Jesus. In him, we learn how to show up for one another. Jesus lived in service to the collective well-being. He sought out those in need of community. He befriended the ones who were isolated. He challenged the structures that destroy. Through his life, you taught us that the same capacities live in us. We too can choose the way of service to collective life. You've given us each gifts to play our part. That same spirit of courage that kept Jesus proclaiming love, even in the face of death, lives in us. And on the night of his arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his companions. He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup and blessed it and shared it, saying, This cup that is poured out is the new covenant, sealed in my blood the new promise between God and mankind. And so in remembrance of all that you've done to save us, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your spirit on these gifts, whatever elements we use. Make the bread and the cup sustenance for our Lenten journey. By your grace, may we experience anew the call you place on our lives to serve one another. And feasting at your table, may our hearts be filled with courage once again to follow Christ, whatever may come. God, your bread and your cup renew our spirits. No matter the times we failed to show up for your call, or the times we failed to hear the cries of our neighbors, you receive us again. May your unending grace be our foundation as we journey with Christ toward justice. 
Amen. Thank you again for joining us for communion. Our communion anthem throughout the season of Lent is Come Ye Sinners. If you will, join me in singing, or you may as well take this as an opportunity to continue preparing your hearts. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. I will arise and go to Jesus, he will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Both their heart ten thousand a joy. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry, you were better, you will never come at all. I will arise and go to Jesus, he will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are ten thousand. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Phil. And so, friends, in remembrance of the great sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf, let us receive the body of Christ with thanksgiving. And with thankfulness for the sacrifice Christ made on our behalf, let us receive the blood of Christ as one faith community. Amen. Okay, so I... I just discovered that I had goofed majorly on Mighty to Save. There is a bridge that I forgot to include. So I'm sorry if you felt like the song was cut short. It was because I didn't have the proper papers with me. I was missing I was missing the page that had the bridge. So I'm sorry. So no, you were not wrong to think, hey, I think there's more to this song. You were absolutely right. It's on me. I forgot to I forgot to use both pages. And I just used the one. So I'm so terribly sorry. But hey, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, our song in closing is In Christ Alone. In Christ Alone is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, what comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, 
there in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness lay. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand amen friends thank you once again for being part of the beacon community of faith this morning I hope and pray that you've experienced the touch of the Lord through this worship service. If you haven't done so, please do take a moment to fill out that digital connection card at beaconlex.org slash connection. And if you're interested in a few minutes of meet and greet, as always, there's a Google Meet link in the video, the video description that you can follow. And we'll just have a few minutes of informal uh, conversation with one another. And now friends, receive this benediction. Go now and live in the spirit of your faith, even when you're led into wild and hard places. With trust, give yourself to God and strengthen yourself against the way of the tempter. And may God enfold you in tender and lasting love. May Christ be beside you in your time of struggle. And may the spirit guide you back to the path whenever you stray. Amen. Friends, go in peace and serve the Lord.